back to D-Lab, still working on that Heathkit 4510 oscilloscope. Power supply is good. Now let's address that triggering issue. So I'll take it to the screen, show you what it's doing, maybe fix it. All right, for this test, I'm using the built-in calibrator. And we're going into channel one. So normally you'd see a square wave like this, right, for your calibrator. As you notice, it's just free running, all right? I'm in their auto position and it won't lock in. So in that case, what would you do? You'd say, okay, I'm gonna go to say channel one plus, flip on the switch and try to adjust my trigger. And it doesn't work. You notice when I flip, you'll see little hints that it's trying to do something, but in no position will the triggering work. If you go back to auto, it just free runs, okay? So that would be absolutely worthless if you're trying to use this scope to measure something. So yes, the triggering is in op. Does not work. So we're gonna have to narrow that down. I've got my suspicions, but let me walk you through the process of figuring this out. So the greatest thing about Heathkit, of course, was their documentation. These manuals had everything from theory of operation, schematics, there's even full foldouts of all their circuit boards and step-by-step -step flow type troubleshooting for every section of the scope. So obviously the first thing that you really wanna do is get familiar with the circuitry. So I always read through the theory of operation, especially for the area that I'm concerned with. And if you flip through here, you will find the horizontal and triggering circuit description. So you want to read this very carefully, especially when they're talking about IC405, because guess what its job is? Yeah, that's the triggering chip. So where's the first place to go? IC405. Let's take a look at the schematic. Well, there is IC405. There is the level control, okay? So it's taking your input. This is a corn parator chip, okay? It's looking at the signal coming in, and then you have an adjustable level that you spin the knob until this chip says, hey, that looks kind of where I want to be, and the output will toggle goes through all these logic chipperinos, goes to the sweep circuit, and locks this thing in. So that is not working. It's not getting that signal. Something's interrupting it. And then if you look closer, you look right there, and you can see the auto normal trigger switch, okay? So when you go to auto, it actually bypasses IC405. These other chips do stuff and make it auto lock. And that's not quite working right either. But if you look, some of the inputs for IC410 come off of 405. So we're back at 405. So what I'm gonna do is take a look at the input, which is pins four and five, and then we'll look at the outputs, which is 11 and 10, and see if this chip is doing what it's supposed to do. And also, it's a good idea. You'll see you have a plus five and a negative five. Remember, we just fixed that power supply so the first thing, obviously, is make sure you got power to the chip. We'll check the signal. If we got the inputs, we ain't got the outputs. Chip's bad. All right, so here is the horizontal and triggering board. Goes right to those knobs you see on the front. It's got these convenient plug-in sockets. So maintenance isn't too big of an issue because if you had to actually solder them in, it'd be a real chore because you'd have to remove the board, right? So the chip in question, of course, is all the way down at the bottom. That is IC405, and it is marked as a 760 DC, okay? So I have the information in the schematic, so let's pin it out. So the first thing we'll do is check the power supply voltages going to that chip, and then I'm gonna check the input signals one of them being the level pot, and the other being the square wave that I'm injecting. And we'll see if we have the output signals. If we don't, we're gonna change the chip. 
So here's a data sheet from Fairchild that I downloaded from the web. This chip is considered obsolete, so it's going to be kind of hard to purchase. But here is a really nice pinout of the chip. Okay, so you can see our inputs on four and five and the outputs on one and two. Pin six is V negative, 12 is V plus, and those are measured to chassis ground. So let's check those two pins and then we'll check your ins and outs. All right, because it's kind of tight to get in there to the chip to measure, I took a little piece of wire, put on a little clip lead so I can get in here, okay? Remember, always be cautious because this thing is powered up. One slip. So there is my negative 5 volts. And that is on pin 6. And pin 12 is right here. There's my positive 5. So power supplies are good. Now, let's take a look at those two inputs which we said is pins four and five okay trying to make sure my meter doesn't glare out on you all right so four and five are my inputs so here I am with my little magic wire again so here is four maybe so it's not easy to get in here. Okay, so that's my level adjustment, okay? You can see that's there. So my level pod is working. Here is five. Is that? Once again. Oh, there it is now. Pretty low. Very low. But, there is a DC voltage, so if I were to take my level adjustment and meet that voltage, which is here, so here's my level adjustment, okay? So if I go down to that point 08 that we just saw, somewhere in that area, I should be seeing something on the screen, and I'm not. All right, to further verify this chip is bad, since voltages on the input signal are so weak, I want to eliminate the possibility of a bad switch or something wrong with the input routing. So I'm using an external power supply, and I'm going to the external trigger input, okay? So now we're here, an external trigger. Got my meter over there. Like I say, it's getting kind of... Uh, crazy here on the bench but anyway so here is pin 5 and that is now coming off my power supply so you can see we have a little bit better input about 0.18 volts we had about half of that before okay so same deal 0.18 there pin 4 which is my variable power coming off the level adjust you can see I can cross over 0.18 and still nothing well, here is the outputs of the original chip you can see we have 3.62 I'm going to adjust the level you see that is not changing at all and of course I have no trace lock on the screen here is pin 11 the other output once again, I'll adjust the trigger level. We have nothing. No change, and of course, no trace locking in on the screen. So now let's put in the new chip. All right, I was able to find one of the chips out of a Model 4 555 Heathkit scope. Unfortunately, this is an obsolete chip, and if you look up Heathkit's number, it's a 442-50. You can get on the Heathkit substitution website and it says it's a U760. It's not. It's a UA760. Okay? So Fairchild used to make them back in the day, but they're not available anymore. 
luckily I have another one. Let's hope it's good. Okay. All right, the replacement chip's in. It's a good thing I cut away because that was quite the struggle getting it in there. Anyway, it looks well seated. I'm going to plug this thing in. Cross your fingers. Here we go. Power back up. I'm back in the auto position. Still using the calibrator. There she is. So same as before. The auto position. She's dancing around. Now let's go to the trigger position. So let's go Y1. Look at there. Look at there. What do we got? It's triggering. It's Y negative. It's drawing. Not so good online, but it does try. Anyway, I always trigger on the channel I'm using. There it is, people. Triggering is repaired on the Heathkit 4510 by using a chip from another Heathkit. All right, so here is the outputs of the chip that is working. So this is pin 10. I'm going to adjust my trigger until it locks in. You can see the voltage. And there is full counterclockwise. There's full counterclockwise. And there it is locked in again. So that is pin 10. Here is pin 11. I'm not locked. Trigger in there. There's full counterclockwise. So you can see we have output on that chip. So I'm pretty sure that we fixed the problem. So that was kind of an oddity for me because normally I get in these type of situations and I narrow it down to a chip. I put in another one and it's the same problem. There's usually always something else. So I got lucky in this case. Now it appears as though Heathkit used that same chip in a bunch of their scopes. So we know for sure the 4555, the 4510, and I believe there was another one, maybe it's called a 4505, something like that. But anyway, probably this entire series of blue and white style Heath kits in that 1970s era shared that same chip. So news update for you, I found a bag of 25 of those UA 760 chips. So if you're working on one of these Heath kit scopes, you've got a trigger problem and you suspect that chip's bad, I've got them on hand. Drop me a line. A task like this without the proper documentation would be a tough one. Thank God Heath kit Engineering put together these great manuals when they sold those scopes. That's probably why they're so expensive, right? Because they built them to last and they built them with the intention of you being able to work on them. It's too bad those days are gone. I can tell you, I sure miss it.